Hello, this is Colonial Puppet, and for Marchintosh 2023, I'm going to be restoring an original Macintosh 128K. I found this Mac locally, being sold in a lot with a few other vintage Macintosh goodies, but I am focusing primarily on the 128K in this video. And you may have noticed two things, one that it's in really rough cosmetic shape, and two, there is a blue D logo on the front. And this isn't a decal, it's actually silk screened onto the front of the computer, making this a Drexel Macintosh. Meaning this was one of the many original Macintoshes deployed at Drexel University way back in 1984. I'll get more in depth about the rich history of this computer later in the video, but for now let's just focus on restoring it. Starting with documenting the computer in the state that I received it in. Here I'm taking multiple pictures of the computer and each of its faces as well as specific problem areas. Here we get a good look at the serial number, which if I'm reading correctly, indicates that this particular Macintosh was manufactured the sixth week of 1984, making it a very early model. We can also see the M0001 model number, which is the model number for the original Macintosh 128Ks. There's also this label at the bottom of the computer, which is almost completely rotted away. I'm guessing that this was the second owner of this computer after Drexel University. In total, I think at least three people owned this computer before it fell into my possession. Anyway, back to the restoration, where it's been established that this computer is in at least very rough cosmetic condition. However, in terms of functionality, I am not sure at this point if it works or not. But regardless, I am going to clean it before testing the functionality because I'd like to be able to handle it without feeling gross. I'll also be restoring the keyboard and mouse that was included in the lot, but I won't be showing any of that on video, just the main computer. Speaking of which, I much prefer cleaning individual parts rather than the computer fully assembled, so the first thing I'm going to do is pop off the back casing. So I've disassembled a Macintosh 512K before on this channel, and with the original Macintosh it's the exact same process. There are five screws to undo before the back case can come off. Two screws are recessed into the handle, while a third screw would normally be hidden behind a battery door, although this computer did not come with that battery door. And then there are two more screws down by the I.O. Once those are undone, the back will pop off with a little bit of effort. Mine put up quite a fight. And lo and behold, the inside isn't much cleaner than the outside, unfortunately. The first thing I noticed was this black soot substance that settled on top of the drive sled. It kind of smelled like cigarettes, so I'm wondering if this computer had belonged to a smoker at one point. The frame also looked quite rusty. Anyway, my goal right now is to get the guts of the computer out so I can clean the case, so the first thing I do is disconnect the logic board from the analog board. Next, I disconnect the drive, allowing me to slide the entire logic board out like so. Now I can remove these four screws holding the drive sled in place. And then out comes the floppy drive assembly. Next it's time to discharge the CRT, which I've done many times on this channel, and it's something that you always have to do when working on these compact Macs, or any system with a CRT for that matter. It's important not to understate just how dangerous these CRTs can be. Next I remove the three Phillips head screws holding the analog board to the frame. And one interesting thing is this high voltage shield. For one thing it almost feels like it's made out of cardstock when all of the high voltage shields I've worked with in the past seem to be made out of some sort of vinyl. It's also grey which is peculiar, I've only ever seen them come in white so I'm guessing this is something that is unique to the earlier Macintosh 128Ks. Anyway, with the screws removed, I can move on to unplugging the yoke and the tube socket.
I also have to remove this torque screw to undo the ground wire. There's also a ground wire attached to the frame here. And now I can fully remove the analog board leaving just the CRT and the frame. And speaking of which, you can now get a good view of just how corroded the frame is. I'll have to deal with this later. For now, I'll have to remove the CRT by undoing the three remaining torque screws holding it in place. Then there's a total of five torque screws that I have to remove in order to remove the frame. Now with the guts removed, I can move on to cleaning the case plastics, starting with a once over with Windex. I use cotton swabs and paper towels for the large areas, and for tight areas like vent holes, I use a toothbrush. Windex is usually the first go-to cleaning solution for these restoration projects because it's really good at removing the surface level dirt and grime. And after the Windex, I followed it up with some isopropyl alcohol to remove some of the more stubborn scuffs and stains. Then I used baking soda to make quick work of any remaining blemishes that couldn't be removed by the alcohol or Windex. This leaves me with a more or less clean case that's covered in baking soda powder, so my last step is to give it a nice clean in the bath. I fill the tub with water and then I use dish soap, sponges, and a toothbrush to fully remove the cleaning solutions before giving the entire case a rinse off. While the case plastics are drying, it's time to move on to cleaning the logic board, which unfortunately had a lot of that black soot that I had mentioned earlier that was on the drive sled. To do this, I took a large plastic container and filled it with 91% isopropyl alcohol, and I used a toothbrush to give the entire logic board a light scrubbing, after which I gave it a blast with some compressed air, followed by a once over with a hair dryer to evaporate any of the remaining isopropyl alcohol. And while that did get rid of a lot of the soot and grime, I did have to follow it up with some spot cleaning using q-tips and cotton swabs. Here you can see just how much soot had settled onto the board. I was eventually able to get it looking brand new, so I gave it one last blast of heat and compressed air. Moving on to the drive sled and the 400k floppy drive, I noticed that there was this label on the side of the drive sled. Now this leads me to believe that this is a replacement drive because one, the address on that label is obviously not Drexel University, who we know is the first owner. It instead matches the label we found at the bottom of the computer, which I think is the address of the second owner, which looking up on Google we can see is a religious retirement community that is still active today. So unless someone at St. Joseph Villa got overzealous with the label maker and decided to crack open the computer and label all of its insides, I think the original drive had failed and the IT department at St. Joseph Villa just happened to have a spare drive on hand. I also think this because while it is a 400k drive, which is the earliest drives that these Macintoshes used outside of the Twiggy drives that the prototypes had, it does appear to be a later version of the Sony 400k floppy drive. Anyway, after removing the drive from the sled, I cleaned all of that soot off using some degreaser. The 
drive's ribbon cable was also pretty dirty, so I used some isopropyl alcohol to clean that off, and I sprayed the connectors with some contact cleaner as well. As for the drive itself, I'm going to be cleaning that later in the video, but for now I'm going to shift my attention to the computer's metal frame. As you may remember, it is pretty corroded and rusty. So the first thing I'm going to do is give it a good clean in some degreaser to separate the loose bits from the actual corrosion, and then I'm going to follow that up with some alcohol. Next I'm going to use this Dremel with a wire brush bit to sort of grind away the corrosion. Now I will admit that I have next to zero experience using a Dremel for this purpose, but at least I am wearing eye protection as well as a face mask to avoid breathing in any metal bits. Anyway, after hitting as much of the corrosion as I could with the wire brush attachment, I moved on to using these abrasive wheels with varying levels of abrasiveness. And then finally, I went over the whole frame with a polishing wheel. And while I admittedly have no experience with polishing metal, I'm not too concerned as the frame isn't something that's outwardly visible, and I'm more concerned with just removing as much of that corrosion as possible. Which, after removing all of the polishing compound with some degreaser and isopropyl alcohol, you can see all of that corrosion has now been removed. And while it's not perfect, I'd take it over what we had before. Next, I'm going to clean off the CRT and spray the yoke connector with some contact cleaner. I also wiped down the front of the tube and cut these loose strands of fabric, trying my best not to unravel them further. I also checked the tube for burn-in, which to my surprise it had virtually none. Given that this is a very early compact Macintosh, plus the fact that it, at least in theory, had some institutional use at Drexel University, it would make one think that it would have at least a little bit of burn-in, but at least at a cursory glance I can't see any. Perhaps this tube was replaced at some point as well. Anyway, at this point I thought it would be a good idea to partially reassemble the computer minus the 400k drive to see what would happen, if anything, when I turned it on. And so now with the computer at least somewhat put back together, it's time for me to turn it on for the first time in what could be decades. Well, clearly something's wrong, but this was honestly a lot better than what I was expecting for a computer that is nearing 40 years old. For one thing, it gave a boot chime, and while the image is obviously squished, the picture does appear to be quite bright and clear. And on the logic side of things, everything at least seemingly looks to be in order. Now I can't test keyboard or mouse inputs, or whether or not it can recognize the floppy drive, but at least I didn't get a dead Mac icon with an error code, and it is instead asking for a boot drive, which is what I want to see. Now, now you may think the picture issue can be fixed with some slight adjustments, but I suspect that the vertical collapse is caused by an electrical issue, either cracked solder joints or bad capacitors or both. So my next step is going to be to inspect the solder joints on the analog board and recap the entire analog board because if the capacitors aren't bad now, they will be going bad eventually and I'd like to get them all replaced as soon as possible. So my first step is to carefully remove that high voltage shield without ripping it. And right off the bat I already noticed a few cracked solder joints so I'm definitely going to have to be doing some reflowing. 
As for the replacement capacitors, as always, I'm using a recap kit I bought from console5.com. I'm not sponsored by them, I just really like their recap kits and highly recommend them. As far as the recapping process, it's pretty straightforward and repetitive, so I'm going to be fast forwarding through most of it. You can check out some of my older videos if you want a more in-depth view of the recap process. Anyway, after recapping, I noticed two things. One, I forgot to take off the brightness control knob. I'll have to clean that later. I also noticed this top metal part was pretty dirty, so I used some degreaser and an abrasive pad to clean that as well. I also made sure to remove any remaining flux from the board after recapping with some isopropyl alcohol. I noticed that the yoke connector cable was dirty, so I cleaned that with some alcohol as well. And while I'm cleaning things, I thought now was a good time to wipe down this RF shield. I also can't forget cleaning the brightness control knob. Anyway, with the analog board recapped and its solder joints reflowed, it was time to pop it back into the computer and see if that fixed the image at all. Lucky for us, the reflowing of the solder joints as well as the recapping of the analog board seems to have fixed the image problem. You can get a good look at just how crisp and bright this CRT is. My guess is that it was a replacement or this computer got very little use in its life. Either way, I can now reattach this high voltage shield. I'm going to use hot glue because it's more or less reversible in case I have to take it off again. And once that's done, it's time to turn my attention to the 400k floppy drive. With the amount of dirt and grime we saw when we first cracked open the computer, my first move was to give it a blast of compressed air. And to give you an idea of just how dirty this drive is, holding it up to the camera, you can see that orange PCB on the right. I had cleaned it with alcohol, and you can see how much brighter it is than on the left side. But before I really get into cleaning the innards of this drive, the first thing I'm going to do is clean off all the old crusty lube from the moving parts. And to do that, I use good old alcohol. Here you can see I'm cleaning the reed head with some alcohol on a Q-tip. Next I do some general spot cleaning with alcohol. Mm -hmm. 
Flipping the drive over, I removed these pesky flathead screws so that I could better get at this PCB and more thoroughly clean it. Next I remove these screws so that I can further disassemble the drive lifting up the top portion like so. I'd argue that the inside of this drive is more dirty than the outside so I'm going to give this a good clean with some alcohol as well. With some further disassembling, I can now clean this portion of the drive much more thoroughly using a toothbrush. With some final touch-ups, I can now reassemble the drive for some relubricating. Speaking of which, while I have the drive still partially disassembled, I'll relubricate these two rails using silicone grease. Next comes some more reassembly and more relubricating. And then lastly, I reattach this PCB to the bottom of the drive. I'll use this blank 3.5 inch floppy disk to exercise the drive and add any additional lubrication as needed. And with the drive reinstalled in its drive sled, it's time to pop it back in the computer and see if it works. <gasps> Yo! The computer is working? Wait, is this the one from Drex? Yes, Drexy! Did you look at that? The drive is now working. It's chugging away loading this MacWrite disk I had lying around. It is running slow as molasses, which is unfortunately something I can't fix because the problem that causes that is that this is a 400k floppy drive from 1984. At this point in the restoration, I was riding on the high of getting this computer fully functional when all of a sudden the screen started to flicker and eventually went black. Popping the analog board back out, I noticed there were some solder joints that I had missed that were still cracked, so I reflowed those and put the whole thing back together. And lo and behold, a fully functional Drexel Macintosh 128K from early 1984. Here you can see I am testing the keys of the keyboard that I had restored alongside this computer, which most of the keys ended up working, although unfortunately there were a few that wouldn't register. Perhaps that will be a future repair video. But anyway, while this computer is working, there are some finishing touches that I'd like to put on this restoration. Starting with some rubber feet, 
all four of the rubber feet on the bottom of the keyboard were missing, as well as two of the four rubber feet on the bottom of the computer. So I bought these replacement feet at the Home Depot, which happened to be a close match to the originals, and I stuck them on like so. Next, you might remember me mentioning that this computer did not come with a back battery door. Thankfully, I did have a spare battery door that I pulled from an old Macintosh Plus that I was able to clean up. But before I pop the replacement door back in, there is one remaining issue, that being the battery bay. Now admittedly, this was something that I probably should have dealt with while I had the analog board out for recapping, but in my defense, the corrosion inside of the battery bay is honestly not that bad. So what I ended up doing was using that wire brush Dremel bit to scrape away some of the battery corrosion. I also used this tiny screwdriver as sort of a dental pick to scrape away any remaining corrosion. Next, I wiped away any remaining battery residue with some degreaser and rubbing alcohol. And then finally, I blasted the whole thing with some compressed air before popping in the replacement battery door. I gave the whole computer one final rub down with some isopropyl alcohol, and with that, I'm going to call this restoration complete. Now for some history. The story of the Drexel Macintosh more or less began in 1982 when Drexel University's then Vice President for Academic Affairs Bernard Sajic convinced Drexel University President William Walsh Haggerty to make microcomputer access mandatory on campus starting with the 1983-84 school year. Not only would incoming students be expected to purchase and use microcomputers, faculty from all departments would also be expected to incorporate microcomputers into their curricula. And so a committee was formed, including President Haggerty and Bernard Sajic, as well as Assistant VP for Academic Affairs Brian L. Hawkins and Thomas Canavan, the then Dean of the College of Humanities and Social Sciences. The plan to fully incorporate microcomputers into higher education was official, and it was decided that Apple Inc would be Drexel's supplier of the micros. But it wouldn't be the Apple II, III, or Lisa that Drexel would be utilizing. Instead, a secret contract between Drexel and Apple outlined that a soon-to-be-released device set to redefine the personal computer would be Drexel's micro of choice. And then in 1983, at a sales meeting in Hawaii, Apple announced what would later be known as the Apple University Consortium. 24 of the nation's leading universities who had partnered with Apple in an effort to introduce microcomputing to the world of higher education. And Drexel University was the very first member of the consortium to require compulsory use of the yet-to-be-released mystery computer on its campus. And so, preparations were made at the university in order to ensure faculty and students would be ready for this drastic change. In the fall of 1983, on-campus renovations were made to support the influx of some 2,000 new computers, and a state-of-the-art computer lab was installed at Drexel's Corman Center. Likewise, a professor named Tom Hewitt started a newsletter called Boot, which aimed to address relevant issues and questions regarding the use of microcomputers, and a group of students with prior experience using microcomputers was formed called the D-Users Group with then mechanical engineering major Denise Walls as president, and then computer engineering major Steve Weintraut as vice president. They were initially tasked with helping to introduce the microcomputer to those on campus unfamiliar with it. They're also widely considered to be the very first Macintosh users group. VP of Academic Affairs Brian Hawkins also helped to train the masses by conducting microcomputing information sessions which were held in Patton Auditorium. And then shortly before its introduction, a group of graduating students user-tested the unnamed computer, after which they were questioned on the computer's effect on stress and anxiety. The results were promising, and Drexel was ready to become a pioneer.
The shakeout is in full swing. The first major firm goes bankrupt with others teetering on the brink. Total industry losses for 1983 outshadow even the combined profits of Apple and IBM for personal computers. It is now 1984. It appears IBM wants it all. Apple is perceived to be the only hope to offer IBM a run for its money. Dealers initially welcoming IBM with open arms now fear an IBM-dominated and controlled future. They are increasingly turning back to Apple as the only force that can ensure their future freedom. <laughs> IBM... <laughs> IBM wants it all and is aiming its guns on its last obstacle to industry control, Apple. Will Big Blue dominate the entire computer industry, the entire information age? Was George Orwell right? On January 24th, 1984, the Macintosh was officially released on the market. And on March 2nd, thousands of Macintosh computers arrived at Drexel University. By March 5th, they were ready for purchase, and approximately 1,850 Drexel freshmen left their dorms to go out and buy their very own Macintosh 128K for the discounted price of $1,000, $1,495 less than its retail price. From then on, the Macintosh quickly began to make its mark on college life at Drexel University. And by 1985, it was fully embraced. The users began publishing a newsletter called Command and had begun freely distributing a terminal emulation package called DU Talk. A micro hotline was established to help troubleshoot malfunctioning Macs, and the D users group organized several Mac events which were hosted on campus, such as Mac Fair 85 and Mac Fair 2, which took place in 1987. A 1985 segment on the show The Computer Chronicles, which highlighted computers in higher education, highlighted Drexel's adoption of the Mac. They call it the Macintosh capital of higher education. There are some 14,000 Macs on the Drexel campus, and just like at Clarkson, every freshman has to have one. Then on the night of March 9th, 1985, Drexel hosted a world premiere of the documentary Going National, which highlighted Drexel's implementation of the personal computer and all aspects of higher education. In attendance was Apple co-founder Steve Jobs, who praised Drexel University as a pioneer for being the first university to introduce the Macintosh into its curricula. Jobs would later be famously forced out of Apple a few months after this premiere. D user President Denise Walls and VP Steve Weintraut were also in attendance and would begin dating that same night, a relationship that lives on to this day. The D users group was eventually disbanded in 2004, but its memory lives on in the form of TechServe, a student-run organization that helps to refurbish and donate computers to those in need while promoting computer literacy across all of Philadelphia. And as for the Drexel Macintosh I restored in this video, I now have it set up at my work cubicle. Ironically, it sits a few feet away from a university Mac lab full of 2022 Mac Studios and M1 iMacs. It's a quaint little reminder of where it all started. But anyway, I hope you enjoyed this video on the Drexel Macintosh, an original Macintosh 128 with a very unique history. I will say that I do hope to add an addendum to this video at some point because I tracked down Steve and Denise Weintraut and asked them a few questions that I hope they get back to me with answers. So far they've been very kind and patient with me. But anyway, this has been Colonial Puppet. Have a wonderful day and happy Marchandosh.